Good evening, Core family. Happy New Year. Let's stand up. Let's sing together. Here we go. The shepherds came to see the baby stood by his mother's side. He led the Savior inside a manger. Oh, what a glorious night. Oh, what a glorious night. I hear the angels. I hear the angels sing. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the core. Uh, to all the members of our church family who are here today, for all of our guests who are stopping by for the first time, or those of you who are returning after our Christmas Eve worship, it is great to have you in church tonight. Uh, if we haven't mentioned yet, my name is Mike. I'm one of the two pastors here at the core. I'm one of the five pastors at our campuses between St. Peter and here downtown. And I'm excited that you could be with us for our fifth annual question and answer Sunday. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in just a second, but first, I want to direct your attention to a couple quick things. Uh, number one, you may have seen those white communication cards that were tucked inside each of your programs. That's a great way for us to communicate with each other. So I'd love for all of you, whether you're a member of our church family or a guest here today, uh, to fill those out. If there's any prayer requests you have, any questions you have about God or our church, uh, let us know. You can pass those in later on in the service and uh, we'll try to follow up with you in the days to come. Uh, second, as I said, this is our fifth annual question and answer Sunday. It's one of my favorite Sundays of the year here at our church because you get to ask questions and I get to open the Bible and try to answer them. So let me tell you how this is going to work. Uh, in your program, you may have seen 
Uh, and if you're live streaming with us on Facebook, hey everyone, uh, you can use your comment section. The rest of you can use your cell phones if you have them with, and if you promise not to check football scores, uh, you're allowed to text me at the number that you see here. It's going to get zapped right to uh, our friends up in the booth above you, and they're going to pick their favorite questions and put them up on the screen for me to open this book and answer. So why are we doing this? Um, is it just a nice way for me not to have to work the week after Christmas? I don't have to prepare a message for you. <laughs> um, actually, a little bit. That is part of the answer. Um, I know when I meet people that everyone, no matter how long they've been going to church or whether it's their first Sunday in a long, long time, they have tons of questions about God and about churches and about religion and about faith and about Jesus and the Bible. Except often we're very scared and intimidated. We don't know when to ask those questions or how to ask those questions. And so we've really come to love this Sunday at our church because no matter how basic or complex your questions might seem, we'd love for you to ask them tonight. Uh, I'm going to cover in three different kind of 15-minute segments in tonight's service as many questions as I can get to. And uh, the rest of my promise to you is that in the weeks to come, uh, depending how crazy my schedule is, maybe, maybe the month or two to come, uh, either written or video, I'm going to try to answer all the questions that you give. Um, so whether your question gets answered tonight or not, know that I'm going to take some time to try to give you a great answer from this book to that question. Now, you have a responsibility too. Um, I want to read you just a quick Bible passage from the book of Acts so that you know what your job is for the next hour that we have together. It comes from Acts chapter 17, uh, right in the middle of a very famous Christian named Paul. He's going around talking about his faith, his beliefs in Jesus, and he gets to this city called Berea, and he starts to preach to the Bereans. And the Bible says the Bereans were really good, noble, godly people. And do you know why? Because they didn't trust Paul. They weren't so starstruck by this celebrity Christian. They didn't just assume that because of all his education, he must be right about everything spiritual. Instead, they kind of listened carefully and then they opened this book and they searched for answers. So here's what the Bible says, Acts 17. Now the Bereans were of more noble character, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So you're going to ask a question. I'm going to try to answer it with this book. But then your job is to do some research and figure out if I'm right. There's a whole lot of pastors with a whole lot of opinions. There's a whole lot of churches in different denominations. And I don't want you to believe what our church teaches or what I think. I want you to know what this book says. So your job as I give answers is to try to listen critically. Am I just kind of giving my opinion and telling like a nice sweet story that gets to your heart and, oh, that must be right. Uh, if I don't use a Bible passage to answer your question, just assume I got it wrong. And if I use a Bible passage, I want you to go back sometime this week and see if I'm saying exactly what that Bible passage says. All right, so you ask honest questions. I'll try to give you biblical answers. And in the end, hopefully we all grow in faith together. All right, I think that's all I needed to say. So you can at any time, once again, pull out your phone. We'll take as many questions as we can get. And our first question for our fifth annual question and answer Sunday is, I don't know, what's on the screen behind me. All right. What are some parts of the Bible, books, chapters, or verses that you or Kim, that's my wife if you're new here, that you or Kim would recommend to share with new wives and mothers or new husbands and fathers? All right. For the first time in Q&A Sunday history, I'd like to invite my wife Kim up to the stage. No. I mean, honey, this is really, the people of God have requested you. No. <laughs> All right, I've been married long enough to know how this is going to go. All right. <laughs> let me give you two passages that I think are really going to help. Let, let me start with the marriage side of things. So if we're asking about wives and husbands, the, probably the best, most balanced biblical passage is Ephesians chapter 5 and the whole section in verses 22 to 23. Let me read you just a, a couple snippets here. Uh, it says actually in verse 21, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Um, the word submit actually means to put another person first. Um, the word sub in Latin means underneath, like a submarine goes under the water. So submission happens when you and another person don't necessarily see eye to eye or agree, but you put your own wants and will underneath theirs so they can have the first position. So how do families work well? How does any relationship work well if I'm not like me-centered, but I'm trying to serve you? Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he goes on to describe marriage. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, 
Paul's last verse, jumping to verse 33, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So if I was going to summarize, like, what makes, I've been married for 15 years, six months, and 15 days. All right, so I've learned um, from the good and the bad of what makes marriage work and what doesn't. Uh, I can almost guarantee when my marriage isn't off the charts good, it's because I've stopped giving up something for my wife. Like, it, it is so, so rare where I'm, like, sacrificing and serving and listening and taking notes, what would make her feel loved. Like, when I do that, as a husband, marriage just works. And I think God knows that. Do you know when it doesn't work? When I turn from her needs and her wants and her preferences to my own. When I start keeping score of how much she's doing and how much I'm doing. When I stop submitting and instead try to get what I want, like, it does not work. But this in practice, to give up everything, like Jesus gave up everything for us, makes marriage so, so incredible. Uh, some of you have heard, uh, this is probably eight, eight, maybe ten years ago. I'm a couple years into marriage, and Kim and I have this, like, not good fight. You know, it's, there's no submission at all. We're both trying to get what we want. And I, I went upstairs, like, walked away in the middle of the argument because I was mad. And above our bed, I put one of those, uh, those fancy sticker things that are like someone wrote in cursive on your wall, uh, like they're really good at painting. And I had this passage, actually, um, that it says, Wives, submit to your husbands, and husbands, love your wives. And I looked at the passage, and I said, You know, God, if she would just do that. <laughs> and because God is good at his job, he like invisibly slapped me just as I was saying that in my head. Like, no, you idiot. You need to worry about your part. Right? So if you're married or if you're going to be married, the most tempting thing in the world is to try to focus on what your spouse should be doing instead of what you can do. Uh, we can't control how people react, but we can really inspire them to love and respect us when we submit to one another in love. So, what makes marriage work? Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. Now, how about um, parents? I'm just curious, show of hands, how many parents do we have here today? Mm, yeah, about half of you or so. Um, I, I think one of my favorite passages as a parent is actually way back in Deuteronomy. Um, this is a passage that Orthodox Jews will say once, if not twice, every single day. Here's what Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 8 says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. You long-time Christians remember that? Jesus said that's the most important passage in the whole Bible. Love God with everything you have. Now get this. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. If there's one bit of advice I would give to every Christian mother and father, it's not to bring your kids to church. Actually, that, that's really good advice. It's just not number one on my list. The, the best thing that parents can do for their kids is to have God's love so impressed on their hearts, that's verse 7a, that they talk about it. That we don't just go on Sunday for an hour and we check the little Jesus box and then go back home to life that doesn't apply to Jesus. But when everything is connected to God, like when dad raises his voice and he goes back and apologizes and prays out loud in front of his kids to Jesus, uh, when grandma gets cancer and the first thing that we do is talk about how Jesus conquered death so we wouldn't have to be afraid of it. Like when we take the everyday things of Tuesdays and Fridays and Saturdays and connect them to Jesus because he's impressed on our heart, that's like the best thing we can do for our kids. Uh, if you ask Pastor Bill from our staff, uh, he would tell you the statistics that as they track kids who are like raised in church, who, who kept with the church in their 20s, you know, there's no magic bullet, obviously. All of his parents wish there was. But the number one factor that keeps young adults connected is whether their fathers talked about God at home. And so you dads have this incredible calling and influence that when you talk about Jesus at home, man, you can make a lasting impact for generations to come in your family. So marriage, Ephesians 5, Deuteronomy chapter 6 for, um, for wives, mothers, husbands, and fathers. All right. Next question, I'm watching people at my stage of life get engaged, move in together, get married, etc., in jumbled up orders. How can I keep my standards high and be patient when I really want the relationships I see everyone else having? <laughs> Whoever asked that, thank you. That's a really good and honest question. You ever seen someone who doesn't necessarily do things God's way and they seem to be really happy? Which is kind of frustrating because <laughs> you're trying to do the right thing and there's no immediate reward. Um, my short answer to the question is this that no matter how 
frustrating or inferior your life seems right now, on the scale of eternity, your life is like this. And eternity lasts forever. And people who want to do things apart from God's way, you know, they'll get their little bit of happiness, but it lasts about this long. That, that's how sin works. But if you are doing what's right in the eyes of God, he will applaud and affirm your decision forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. <laughs> uh, one of my two favorite chapters in the entire Bible is from Psalm 73. Oh man, that's not good. <laughs> my pages are falling out of my Bible. <laughs> yeah, Psalm 73, there's a guy named Asaph who actually went through this same thing. Uh, he's talking about uh, verse 3. He says, I envy the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from the burdens common to man. They're not plagued by human ills. So he sees people like doing things not God's way and he's like envious of it. But then here's his conclusion at the end of Psalm 73. He says, When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet, I am always with you. God, you hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Here's what I would say to you. Um, there are people who can move in and sleep around and do sex and relationships their way, but they only get a person or momentary pleasure. If you're a Christian, you have God. God. <laughs> and if the Holy Spirit starts to open your eyes that God is infinitely better than any human person, you'll realize that those people should be jealous of you. Because if you're following Jesus, you have God now and for an eternity to come. So my, my prayer for you would be, remember how good God is, and remember how long eternity lasts. That's the antidote for every bit of envy and jealousy that we might feel. All right, great question. Two down. A couple dozen to go. Question number three. Let's put the next one up here. Oh, what role do angels play in our modern day lives? I've been watching a lot of the Hallmark Channel uh, during the Christmas season. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that is a tough question. Darn it, you guys are awesome at this. So, um, the, do you know what the word angel means? Uh, in Greek, the word angel means messenger. Uh, if you think of the word evangelism, it has the word angel in the middle because evangelism, evangelism is bringing a good message to someone. So generally in the Bible, I just did a study after our Christmas series, um, generally in the New Testament, when angels would come, they wouldn't like keep cars on icy roads like we normally think of angels doing. They would come with a message. So they came with a message to Zechariah. Uh, your wife's going to be pregnant. She's going to give birth to John the Baptist. The angel Gabriel comes with a message for Mary. You're about to bear the Savior of the world. Uh, the angel comes to the shepherd. says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great choice. In the Bible, angels primarily give a message but not always. Sometimes they work incredible miracles and the book of Hebrews kind of gives us this little teaser. It says in uh, Hebrews 1 verse 14, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? And the answer to that question is yes. So angels are ministering spirits. So you can't see them. They're not physical. They're spirits. And they're sent to serve those who inherit salvation. You know who inherits salvation? You, if, if you believe in Jesus. So the Bible makes this incredible promise that like the invisible angels are actually serving you. They're carrying out God's purposes to help you. Now, what does that exactly look like? <laughs> and the answer is I have no clue. I, I really have no clue. I, I think it's going to be awesome one day. I'm not, I'm not sure if God ever like shows you the whole playbook and kind of pulls back the curtain when you see him, how angels helped us and kept us from temptation. Um, man, we could only really guess how often God's ministering spirits keep temptation away, keep us safe, and keep us close to God. Um, so I wish I had more specific examples. I know there's a lot of angel stories out there. Some of them seem to be very true. Some of them you never know it's a stretch. So I never want you to put your confidence and hope and faith in something that's not like rock solid and sure. So I can give you the incredible promise that you are not alone uh, as you go through life or fight against temptation. Incredible beings uh, are sent to serve you, those who will inherit salvation. 
All right, next question. I sometimes think negative slash doubting thoughts when I read the Bible or hear scripture. Is it normal to question or doubt? Why haven't I stopped doubting? Does he, God, want me not to doubt? Yeah, that's all. I love honesty. Thanks for being an honest church, by the way. Um, have you ever thought something really messed up when you're in church and then you think, I'm messed up to think something messed up when I'm in a place like this? Um, I know some people from our church have confessed that. Like, man, just when you think you're making like a good turn in your spiritual life and then these crazy things pop into your head and like, where did, where did that come from? Um, why does that happen? Well, the answer is simple. Um, the Bible says that there are three enemies to your soul. What's within you, what's out there, and the enemy uh, that Jesus called the accuser or the devil. So think about that. The sinful nature in your heart, the, the world that kind of corrupts the way that you think, and then the enemy who just wants to turn a great experience like church into something toxic. Or when you open the Bible to get truth, he wants to fill you with lies. Right? So if the human heart, uh, Romans 8 says, is hostile to God, it's always pushing back, it wants to get the last word, then no doubt you can't, I mean, you can't walk into a church and think that you're safe from like evil influence. That's always going to be there like fighting us like this tug of war. In uh, Revelation chapter 12, I think of how the devil is described. Uh, it says, Revelation 12 verse 10, the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night. So what is the devil doing day and night? He's accusing you. He's saying, you're not good enough to be here. Look how sinful you are. You're thinking that in the house of God? Like you're singing about the birth of Jesus and then that goes through your mind? Like he's just relentless, accusing, accusing, accusing. And then you spend your week with social media feeds and Netflix movies and it just like soaks into your brain. And no wonder, like you could be praying or opening the Bible or singing a song in church and all kind of crazy things would pop into your mind. So is it normal to question or doubt? Yes. If you never question or doubt, you are in heaven. So that's all of us, right? Why haven't I stopped doubting? Because you're not in heaven. Does God want me not to doubt? Absolutely. That's why one day he's going to take you to heaven. All right, so that's a very normal thing as we fight. Uh, let me read to you the end of the passage. The accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They, the Christians, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and therefore rejoice. So whenever that comes, whenever you're under assault, you just remember the blood of Jesus makes you perfect in the sight of God and you can tell, tell the devil to go back to hell where he belongs. All right, next passage. Or next question, I should say. Who originally put all the books of the Bible together into one book? I'm looking at the young man who asked me that question. I knew he was going to ask it because I don't know the answer to it. Um, <laughs> yeah, aren't you curious about that? Like, now you go to the Christian bookstore and it's nice, like, bound together. But, you know, these books are written from the days of Moses, like 1500 BC to the Apostle John, 180. 1,600-year span, different authors, different continents, different cultures, different languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Uh, we have kind of like an imperfect understanding of how that all happened. As things were like written down, we know the ancient Jews would keep individual scrolls of Bible books. Sometimes they would combine the books together. Sometimes synagogues would have them. They're copied by hand. Uh, they'd make copies of copies and spread them to other churches. And things were kind of gathered slowly and surely in the Old Testament, it seems like there was a priest named Ezra, uh, kind of at the end of the Old Testament, who had kind of gathered and really knew the law. So some people think Ezra was kind of connected to the original gathering of the Old Testament. And uh, the, the New Testament, as the gospel spreads to so many places, a little less precise. Uh, so we know as the years went by, God's people recognized his word. Uh, they realized in all the churches, people are seeing these writings of the prophets and the apostles. <laughs> but unfortunately, this is one where I can't find a Bible passage and prove like, Here's when it happened. Here's the date. Here's how it happened. That's actually going on my list to ask Jesus when I see him face to face. All right, a couple more questions. Oh, actually, before I get there, um, did my answer make you nervous? Like, oh my goodness, what if we have the wrong Bible or what if, you know, someone snuck their little pamphlet in there and it didn't belong? Uh, one of the really cool things about Jesus is not just that he teaches us but that he affirms the books of the Old Testament. Um, so Jesus dies on the cross and he rises from the dead and then, uh, this super cool story. He uh, appears to these two guys who are walking, like moping because they think that Jesus isn't actually alive and actually does a Bible study with them. And uh, do you know what the Bible study was based on? The 39 books of the Old Testament. 
Um, Jesus himself in Luke 24 affirmed, it says uh, 24 verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, that was sometimes a nickname for the Old Testament, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And in verse 44, he did it again. Everything must be fulfilled that's written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. So Jesus himself had the chance to say, whoa, you guys got this all wrong, or yeah, you got the word of God, and he put a stamp of approval on it so that we can be sure that what we're reading actually comes from God and not just from man. All right, let's take uh, maybe two more questions before our next break. How do you get someone to see that they have nothing to do with their salvation and that Jesus has everything to do with it? Um, ooh, my short answer to that question is you don't. <laughs> I mean, to have someone who is spiritually blind, being able to see, like you simply as a human being don't have that ability, but the Holy Spirit does. So how does the Holy Spirit help someone see like you can't earn your way you can't be good enough. You can't check enough boxes. You can't give enough dollars. You can't attend enough services. Um, this is a great passage. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Get this. It says, It is by grace you have been saved. Uh, grace means undeserved love. It's a gift. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So I'd probably share this passage and let the Holy Spirit open someone's eyes. Like, wait, if, if good people made it to heaven and bad people didn't, couldn't they boast about it before God? Well, I made these choices and those people didn't. And the answer would be yes. If, if that's the way it worked, you could boast. Um, if faith was some great thing that you did, you know, I decided or I chose or I believed, couldn't you boast about that because some people didn't? And the answer would be Yes. <laughs> So the only reason that salvation can be an entire gift and this passage is true is because it's by grace that you have been saved and it's not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. So I think what I would do if a person is having trouble grasping that, I'd read a passage like Ephesians 2 and help them to see that it's, it's all Jesus and then maybe turn to passages like uh, Romans 3 verse 23 and Romans 6 verse 23, the wages of sin is death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if a person sins just once, they're not good enough to stand in the presence of a sinless God. And so they really need it to be a gift. And thankfully, Jesus is so good and generous, it is a gift. If you share those words, the Holy Spirit uses those as a tool to open people's hearts and minds. So Ephesians 2, Romans 3, and Romans 6. All right, last passage before our next song. Is it wrong to get a tattoo? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Did I make a mistake? Some of you not know that I have a tattoo on my arm. Um, so where does that come from? Show of hands, anyone ever heard someone say that it's, it's wrong for a Christian to get a tattoo? Yeah, most of you have, have heard that. Um, in the Old Testament, there actually is a passage. I'm going to forget um, exactly where it is. I think Leviticus 18, maybe, that talks about like getting marked on your body and it's connected to, give me one second, see if I can find it. No, I'm not going to be able to find it off the top of my head. Yeah, so the, um, it's in the book of Leviticus, I remember. And the idea is like not marking or cutting your body. There's an ancient pagan practice that was like connected to pagan worship that in the culture, you know, way back in the days of Moses, that is what they did. And so some people have taken that passage to say, see, like you shouldn't mark up your body. Oh, I actually had this woman at my old church when I got a tattoo, all her sons had tattoos. Like, pastor, it's in the Bible. You shouldn't get that if... Like, God gave you the body that you have and you don't need to alter it, you're just fine. To which I said, nice makeup. <laughs> to which her daughter said, Mom, shouldn't you tell Pastor that your eyeliner is tattooed? <laughs> to which I said, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the, the passage is in there and some people kind of jack it out of context. Um, the interesting thing is that the Old Testament has a whole bunch of rules that were meant to set God's Old Testament people apart, right? So if you'd read that, you'd find out you couldn't eat bacon or pork or ham and I would have to grow a certain style of beard and you couldn't wear clothes that were mixed with two different fabrics. Like God had all these special rules to really set the Jewish people so everyone could look at a person and know that they were Jewish when they were walking down the streets 
And then when God blessed all those people, they would know that must be the true God that they're following because he's blessed them in such incredible ways. Right? So the Old Testament has a whole bunch of things about the way we live our lives. The thing about tattoos is not repeated in the New Testament. In addition, if you're here during the, uh, Christmas week, you know from Revelation chapter 19, Jesus shows up on the judgment day and the Bible says he has written, what, on his thigh that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. So unless the angel Gabriel like, took a sharpie to the thigh of Jesus, he's rolling up with some ink and he's ready to conquer all of our spiritual enemies. So is it wrong to get a tattoo? Uh, my short answer to that question is no, it is not. Use it in wisdom. You're going to have it for the rest of your life, so make sure you enjoy it. Spend good money to get a guy who can draw straight lines and gets the words right. And if you get a Chinese tattoo, just make sure to ask some Chinese friends what it actually means before you put it on your body. All right. We're going to take a short break. Once again, you continue to texting questions to the number you see in your program. We'll pass things over to our musicians for our next song. All right, round two. 
question and answer. Let's see what's up next. Why should I believe everything the Bible says is true or God's word? Jesus. Next question. <laughs> I would say that. Um, if Jesus believed this book was more than just the writings of some dudes, if he believed this book actually came from God, and he didn't just say that and die and move on like everyone else in human history, but he predicted his own death and resurrection, and on the third day it came true, he's a pretty good guy to trust. <laughs> So if any of you could predict the day you would rise from the dead and then have the power to do it, I would, I would trust you too. Um, why should we believe the Bible? You know, it's easy to quote a passage like 2 Timothy 3.16. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed, which means God, he inspired it. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So the Bible itself would say this does come from God. It's God-breathed. It's actually inspired by the Holy Spirit himself. Um, but if someone's not a Christian, they're not going to say, oh, okay, then I'll believe everything it says. <laughs> now, it's kind of the Holy Spirit changes your heart first when you realize who in the world would do what Jesus did. And then you come to trust the things that Jesus said, including his confidence in the scriptures. And the reason I kind of get there is maybe two other side roads to think about is who in the world, what other holy book, religion, or philosophy would love you in the same unconditional way that the God of Christianity does? Do you know what all religions have in common that Christianity is just radically different is the idea of unconditional love, <clears throat> right? So if you're a Hindu, you believe in karma. If you do enough good works, you'll get good karma. You'll be reincarnated better and better and better poof, until you reach, you know, eternal bliss. If you're a Buddhist, you try to do enough good works, escape the pain and illusion of this world until you disappear and experience nirvana. If you're Jewish, you keep the Ten Commandments. If you're good enough, you'll be judged well by Yahweh on the judgment day. If you're a Muslim, you keep the five pillars of Islam. And if you do enough good things, the Quran says that Allah is going to pull out the scales. And if you're a good enough person, you will be saved. The average American believes if you're good, God will bless you and take you to heaven. Because if you're better than most, you get to go to a better place. Right? Which all sounds nice and it's very, very logical. That's the way the world works. But then Christianity comes along in a passage like I read to you before, Ephesians 2, and it says, it's by grace that you've been saved. And it's not by works. You can't boast. It's just the gift that God gives you because he loves you. And it's like the one belief that actually can give you confidence that you're ready to die, that you're right with God. How do you know you've, you've done enough? I mean, if there were actually scales, how in the world would you measure them? Like the things that you've said in moments of anger, how bad is that? How many church services do you have to go to to make up for that? You would have no clue. So you can never have peace. You can never rejoice in your relationship with God. But if it is a free gift, man, it's so incredible. And so the Holy Spirit uses just the goodness of that message to change people's hearts so that they trust God's word and to follow Jesus. So simple answer, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, and the grace that really gets us to trust in that, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. All right, next question. Was there a passage in the Old Testament about the star how did the wise men know to look for it? Oh, yeah. Uh, do you know the story of the wise men? They're the guys. We don't know how many of them there were. And we don't know the color of their skin. And we don't know their names. But we do know that they weren't there the night that Jesus was born. All right, did you hear me vent about this on Christmas Eve? All right, if you're, if you're wise men are in your nativity set next to the shepherds, you get them to the other side of the piano or the mantle or I'm going to have to kick you out of our church because we just can't have false teaching like that existing around us. Um, you know, they, they show up in Matthew chapter 2 and they ask King Herod, we saw his star rising in the east and we've come to worship the king of the Jews. And I think this question is getting, how, how did they know, like, oh, there's a star, the king of the Jews must be born. Well, there's this kind of obscure passage in the book of Numbers. It's Numbers chapter 24. I don't have time to tell you the whole story today. Basically, the children of Israel are marching. They've been freed from Egypt as slaves and they're about to enter this new promised land. And there's a king from, was it ancient Moab, I think? His name was Balak. And he wanted to curse the Jewish people. So he found this sorcerer named Balaam. It's really interesting. You should read the whole Bible. And he says, curse those people. <laughs> Except God, like, he messes with Balaam and all Balaam can do are bless the people of God because they will be blessed. 
right? In the middle of this like weird kind of exchange, here's what Balaam says. It says, then Balaam uttered this oracle. Balaam said, I see him. Like, wait, him? Not, not them, the people of Israel? No, I see him, but not now. So sometime in the future, I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob and a scepter will rise out of Israel. Israel will go strong. A ruler will come out of Jacob and destroy the survivors of the city. So it's the only kind of obscure reference we have that there was this like rumor that existed among the ancient eastern people that somehow a star would rise and that would mark the ruler coming uh, to govern over the people of Israel. So that's Numbers 24, verse 17. Ooh, that's kind of Bible nerdy right there, wasn't it? Is that going to change your week this week? Now you know where it comes from? Tell your coworkers about Numbers 24. All right, next passage. <laughs> next question, I should say. What is the difference between free will and God's plan? Oh my goodness. If I wasn't hopped up on Dayquil right now, I still wouldn't be able to answer that question. Um, free will and God. All right, so there's these two tensions, right? There's the idea that God is in control of everything. He's all powerful. He's sovereign. The Proverbs talk a lot about how God is in control of even like the decisions that rulers make and those who rise to power. And yet the Bible talks a whole lot about choosing things and free will. And it's not like if I reach for, like, I was going to wear this pair of shoes to church, but then somehow, you know, like the Holy Spirit pushed my hand, so I had to grab the brown ones. So there's, like, these two things are intention at, at the same time in the Bible. And so we trust that God is all powerful and he reigns over all things. And yet we realize that we get to make conscious decisions each day. Um, so I think of Joshua chapter 24 uh, is one of those passages that uses a word like choose. Uh, I have this stenciled in my kitchen. Let me just make sure I'm quoting it well for you. Um, Joshua said, Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So he's basically telling the people, all right, you get to choose. You, you have free will. Who are you going to serve? I, I know what my family is going to do. What about yours? So there's the free will. And then there's God's plan. That God can use the choices that we make to accomplish great things. Um, God knew that Judas would be greedy and would betray Jesus. He knew that Pilate would be corrupt and would not stand up for justice. He used all the free choices that those guys made and he worked out his incredible plan. So how that works in the day-to-day -day stuff of life is really difficult to get our arms around. You know, it's the mystery of the wisdom of the knowledge of God. Uh, but we do know that, that both exist. You get to make real choices today to follow God or not and God will use whatever choices you make to carry out his plan for his people. So that Romans 8 verse 28 is true in all things. God is working for the good of those who love him. Oh, that's a tough question. All right, next one. What is the line between lovingly pointing out a neighbor's sin versus approaching people the way the Pharisees did? Ooh. All right, let's imagine Let's imagine your best friend um, is gossiping. You know, just trash talks everyone. Um, now let's assume for the sake of the argument she comes to the same church with you. <clears throat> the Bible says we have to be careful about judging non-Christians and holding them to Christian standards. But she claims to be a Christian. She's a member of the church. Now she's gossiping. Like, do you say something? And if so, how do you say it? I think this question is like, how do you like lovingly correct someone? The Pharisees were famous for correcting people, but they were super proud and self-righteous. And I think a great answer to that is in Luke chapter 18. You can write that down while I'm finding it. Luke chapter 18. Um, Jesus told this story about a Pharisee and a tax collector, and this is how it started. It said, To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. And I think that's the key. Um, things blow up when you honestly think in your heart that that person is a worse sinner than you are. When you look at someone's behavior and instead of like being heartbroken that they're hurting themselves or the people around them, it just, it frustrates you because why would you ever do something like that? Because you don't do it? Whew. That's when you need to push pause and check your own heart. Um, whenever you can look down, you know, it's those people in our city, it's those people in our country, it's those people. At our, whenever you're not like the worst sinner in the room in your own mind, you really, really have to be careful. 
Because you're probably not doing it out of love. You're probably doing it more out of self-righteousness. And we just have to correct people like you and then things would get fixed. So I think a key is just a wide-eyed awareness of your own sinfulness. To realize that if it wasn't for the grace of God and the Holy Spirit of God, you would do all of that times a hundred. And then you're going to be humble enough to approach someone in love. Right? Um, this happens all the time because we sin in different ways. I think this is one of the devil's best tools. Um, so let's imagine you're married and let's imagine uh, your husband struggles with sexual temptation and pornography. And you just don't get it. I mean, it's so hurtful and you've talked to him about it and it didn't just happen once or twice but five times and ten times and you're, you're so frustrated because he should just stop, right? But the problem is if, if you don't realize that there's something just like that, like you have your own version of pornography that hurts him and he's talked to you about it and you don't just stop it. But it's different. Like that's, that's the danger. When your sin is so easy that we should turn it off like a light switch, but mine's more complicated and you, and you don't understand, like th- then you're in Pharisee mode. But when you really understand, like sin is difficult to say no to. Like I, I totally get it. I lose the battle a thousand times. But you know what, brother, sister, I'm, I'm really concerned about what I'm seeing in you and I want to talk to you about it. You're going to have a humble, compassionate, forgiving heart. So look in the mirror. Be very aware of your own sinfulness. You'll have the humility that you need to approach sin well. Great question. All right, next. Are there different levels of heaven? Also, are there levels of hell? Sounds like a video game, doesn't it? Like, <laughs> do 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 do. You get the mushroom and woo, you fly up to different levels. Um, the short answer is yes. Can I prove that to you? Man, put an asterisk next to this one. My brain is blanking on me of what passage uh, to go to. Let me start talking. Um, The Bible says that if anyone gets to heaven, they will be happier than they've ever been. They will never feel regret or jealousy or envy or pride. So can we start there? Like when you get to heaven, you're just going to be so ridiculously happy that you look into the eyes of God and his face that all the best things of this life will seem small. So whatever, if we want to call them levels or places that you're at in heaven, you know, it's not like some of us are going to be in the gated community of heaven and then some of you are going to be with me and we're like, we got our foot in the door. We're like, no, I did have faith, you know, let me in. (laughs) So it's not going to be like that kind of levels. But the Bible does talk about in some crazy way that God will reward his saved people for the good choices they've made. I want to be super careful with that, all right? So when you get to heaven, like I said before, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it's a total gift. Right? No one gets there except by the pure grace of God. But then God is actually so kind and he's so generous that if you went through some hard things in this life and he was watching, not only will he save you as a pure gift, but he will actually reward you for the good works that you did. Not with heaven itself, but with some greater capacity to experience joy or happiness or I don't even know how to explain it. Right, so Jesus talked about that in Matthew 25. Uh, he said on the judgment day when we stand before him, he's going to say, come, share in your master's happiness. And he said, I, you know, you did all these great things for me. And he recognizes the good works that we did. So back to one of our earlier questions. Uh, you know, this Christian says, I see everyone doing relationships that aren't God's way and like, how do I stick to my standard? This would be my answer. Because whatever earthly, you know, joy you could get out of something here and now, no, there, there's going to be some experience in heaven that's going to be so, so much better. In the same way Jesus said, um, those cities that had experienced his miracles and his teaching and flat out rejected him would suffer more on the judgment day than Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, Read through the Gospel of Matthew. I think that comes up a number of times. He says, woe to you, Capernaum. Woe to you, Chorazin. If the miracles that were done in you had had been done in these other places, they would have repented, but you didn't. So there seems to be this idea that like if you live in America and there are Bibles in every hotel you stay in and you have the chance and you totally stiff-arm Jesus, like there will be a greater degree of suffering. And for God's people who don't just believe but they live out their faith in humble obedience, God generously, crazily will bless us with crazy happiness. Um, someone told me this kind of way of picturing it. Like if I have a, a coffee cup like this and I fill it up, imagine that's my happiness. Like that's when you get to heaven, you're filled up. Maybe God just gives you a little bit bigger cup if you've served him well. And you're all the way to the top. Everyone is going to say, I'm as happy as I could possibly be 
but somehow God might make the cup bigger. So it's kind of obscure. It's a little bit difficult to wrap your brain around, but it's actually really, really encouraging because it means whatever good you do in Jesus' name, like it will reap an eternal reward. So don't lose heart and serve him in faith. All right, let's do two more questions. How do faith and works go together? Oh, um, if any of you are podcasters, we actually did a 10-week sermon series here in the book of James about two years ago called Faith Works. So if you want like a six-hour answer to that question, you can, uh, you can listen to all of those. How do they work together? Uh, I've been quoting that great passage from Ephesians. Get this. I left a verse off for you. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Um, how do faith and works go together? God gives you the gift of faith when you hear the message about Jesus. And it is so beautiful and compelling that you want to do good works to serve other people and thank God in return. Right? Imagine if you weren't saved as a gift. Imagine if you had to earn your place in heaven. Do you know why you would do good works? Out of self-interest. Oh, sure, I'll donate money because I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> oh, sure, I'll help this old lady across the street. Did you see that, God? Can, can you imagine? Like, if you had to earn your way like every other religion teaches, it would actually become the most self-serving morality that you can think of. But, but if God just gives you a gift, if he gives you eternal happiness in his presence for free, whew, it just has a way of messing with your heart that you want to love people. And so the Bible will say things like 1 John 4, we love because he first loved us. Um, Titus chapter 2 says Christ's love compels us. Grace teaches us to live self-controlled and godly lives. So that's how they work together. When God gives you faith, there are works. Works don't save you, but whenever you have real faith, there will be good works in your life that you do because you love God. Huge question. Thank you. All right, last one before our next song. If animals do go to heaven, why don't they need to be baptized? Gosh. Every year. Why? Every year, the children get really mad at me because I insist on being biblical to this question. Um, all right. If you're under 10, just close your ears for a second. I got to <laughs> talk to the grown-ups. Uh, the answer is y'all need to think way more about God. You know, here's what I used to say in answer to that question. I used to say, well, technically, um, body and soul separate when you die and souls go to heaven or hell. And since God only created human beings with souls and animals don't have it, animals just die and go on the ground and they don't have souls to be in God's presence. So all, no, all dogs don't go to heaven. No dogs go to heaven. None of any pets go to heaven. And you know how people react to that? They get mad. <laughs> really mad. No one's thankful for my biblical answer. Like, I, we've, we had more people, like, leave that <laughs> over that teaching at our church than the teaching of hell here at the core. So it says something. But you know what? I've, I've started to realize that when people think of heaven, they think of it as escaping something bad instead of getting to someone good. Right? What makes heaven heaven? God. The most interesting, compelling, powerful, beautiful, funny, creative, inventive. I mean, you think the Grand Canyon is interesting. Nothing is interesting compared to the presence of God. You think when you, when you see God's face, you're going to be looking for Fido? Oh, where is, where is Mr. Sniffles? Is he here, Jesus? Like, no, when you see Jesus, oh my goodness. Remember Psalm 73? Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. Your heart was created to crave something way more than a pet. God gave you the pet to get a little glimpse of his love, faithfulness, and compassion. So, we don't baptize dogs because they don't have souls. Animals will exist in the new earth when Jesus comes back and renovates all things and our bodies are raised from the dead. But when you get to heaven, there will be no pets and you will be absurdly happy. And if you want to find another church, uh, St. Peter Lutheran is just on the northeast side of town. So <laughs> you can Google that. Man. Uh, some of you know that that's been a passion for me in recent years. I'm actually attempting to write a book about this idea called God is Here. And, and the big idea of the book is like, 
God. Like, let's not make too, but let's, hallowed be your name, God. When I think of you, God, let, let it be so profound that nothing else, no relationship, no job, no promotion, no compliment, like, God, the thought of God with me makes my heart so, so happy. One, one day it will, and you'll experience it. But until then, let's strive for that, right? God is what makes heaven so good. All right. So we're going to continue to sing. We're also going to gather our offering at this time. So as a reminder, if you filled out that white communication card, uh, we'll give you just another minute if you haven't had a chance to do that just yet. Behind me, you can see there's a bunch of ways to give here at the core. If you'd like to generously support our ministry, we thank you. And during the gathering and the offering, we'll also join Jonathan and our band in singing our next song. last round. Let's tackle a few more of your great questions. Uh, how can I share God's truths with Christians who are heavily based in the law? Uh, great question. 
Um, little context, there are two main teachings in the Bible, and if you don't get these two teachings clear, uh, you're not going to get Christianity. And the teachings are the law and the gospel. The law is basically all the things that you do or you choose not to do. You know, be kind, love God, share your faith, uh, don't get drunk, be generous, don't be greedy, don't be a racist. Those are all laws and they come from God and they're really good things that bless people when we live by God's law. Then there's the gospel. The gospel has nothing to do with you. It's not something you do or don't do. It's something that Jesus did. So when we say that God loves you and God sent his son for you and Jesus died on the cross and Jesus shed his blood and Jesus forgave your sins and Jesus rose from the dead, that's not something you do. That's just something really good that you believe. That's the law and the gospel. Now, most Christian churches that I know believe that on paper. There's law and gospel, but every church has its own kind of culture. You know, is there a lot of gospel or is there a lot of law? Is it like hammering you home? You feel like you're a terrible person every time you leave because, man, you're still not good enough and you need to do this and people don't get sucked into the culture and you just kind of hang your head when you go? Or is it all kind of light and fluffy and God is love and we never correct sin and you know, God loves everyone and everyone's just fine. God loves you just as you are. You're perfect. Kind of this hallmark theology. And, and so it's really tough actually to get a good distinction between the law and the gospel. Uh, maybe a good passage to emphasize what I'm talking about is Romans chapter 3. Uh, it's probably the best chapter that keeps these two separate and clear. It says, 3 verse 20, No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. So if you want to be righteous, which means if you want to be right with God, no one can do it by observing the law because you'd have to be perfect to be with a perfect God. Verse 21, But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So there's the beautiful gospel. All right? So this person is asking, how can I share God's truth with Christians who are heavily based in the law? Um, my quick answer would probably be show them the beauty of living in the gospel. That when you really every day, I mean, you're so aware that you fall short of the law and every day you sin and yet you have this, like you're not depressed and you don't live with shame because you know the gospel says you're right with God, you're cleansed, you're forgiven by the blood of Jesus and that brings you such joy and motivation that trying again tomorrow to love God and love your neighbor isn't like a burden, you're excited about it. And that's so abnormal for some people who are on like the treadmill of Christianity, always got to do more, always got to give more, always got to read more, always got to pray more, always got to share my faith more. That I think if you just have like the peace and joy that comes from really deeply believing the gospel, it will be a magnet to them. Um, I know there's a lot of church cultures that that was kind of the thing. You know, we wanted to help people with marriage and finances. So we started speaking about felt needs. You know, here's, here's three things that you can do to have a great marriage. And people like that, except over time it kind of burdens you, right? Because we all struggle with sin. And every Sunday, if you just come back and hear more things you need to do and more things you're failing at, like eventually you'll just burn out and you'll give up or you'll have to ignore some things that you're not doing well. So really keeping a, a good tension there between the law and the gospel and keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus is a great way because, man, you'll just live with such freedom and joy that only the gospel can give. That's uh, Romans 3, verses 20 and 21. All right, next question. What passages can I turn to for mental illness and is mental illness sin? Um, let me start with the second question. Um, mental illness is not a sin, but it is a result of having sin in the world. All right, so if there was no sin, would we battle depression and anxiety and things that just cripple us mentally? The answer would be no. Uh, when Jesus comes back and the world is made perfect, there will be no physical illness or mental illness. Um, is it a sin if you battle depression or anxiety? The answer is no. But you need to know that when you're in that state of mind, like it is very easy to sin. And I know so many people in our church know this really well. Um, it's so easy to doubt God's promises and his love, his power, his plans for us. So where do you turn to when you're in like a really depressed spot or you're really anxious about something in your life? Um, my best answer would just be this. <clears throat> when we look inside of ourselves, we see a lot of imperfections. We see a heart that sometimes trusts and sometimes doesn't. But when we open this book, we find so many good passages about God's promises to us. And I want to encourage you, like, even if in the moment something in you is doubting it, just like 
stay connected to it. Allow God to speak to you and allow people in your life to be able to speak those same passages to your heart. Uh, a great passage like 1 Peter 5 speaks specifically about anxiety. I love this one. Um, it says, Cast all your anxieties on God because he cares for you. <laughs> Which to me is the perfect passage. It's not just like, all right, there's the law. Cast all your anxiety on God. Give it to God. Let go and let God. But the passage doesn't end there because God knows about the gospel. Cast all your anxiety on God because he cares for you. So just meditating on stuff like that, like God still cares for me. After all the junk I've done, he still cares about me. He cares about my finances. He cares what I'm anxious about. He's, he cares what makes me depressed. He cares about my drinking. He cares about my marriage. He cares about my kids. He cares about our country. He cares for me. And passages like that kind of snap us out of our own thinking and remind us how big and caring and loving and forgiving God is. So is mental illness a sin? No. What passages can I turn to for mental illness? Um, read the Psalms, I would say, because there are tons. I, I think David, I think he battled depression. I mean, he gets really low in the Psalms and they're really honest and they're really going to resonate if that's your kind of mental spot in life. But he finds so much hope in the power of the promises, the love and the forgiveness of God. So when I meet with people who are depressed or anxious, I basically say, you know, read a Psalm a day. In the morning, before you go to bed at night, you're going to find some great food for your soul from the book of Psalms. Thank you for the honest question. All right, next. Are there signs today that we are living in the end times? Yes. Were there signs in 50 AD that they were living in the end times? Yes. Because you know what the end times mean in the Bible? <clears throat> All the times between the ascension of Jesus and the return of Jesus. <laughs> the last days, the end times. Are there wars? Matthew 24 and 25. Rumors of wars, disease, famine, false teaching, people turning their backs on God and the stuff that matters. Yes. Well, the Apostle John have said, it is getting so bad here in 190 whatever AD. Like, this must be the return of Jesus. Yes, the, the apostles thought that Jesus was going to return in their lifetime. And I think every Christian who has their eyes wide open to how messed up the world is still takes their confidence in that too, right? So 2 Peter chapter 3, so I'm my Bible's open there, talks about the day of the Lord, which is the return of Jesus. And it says, uh, So dear friends, since you are looking forward to this day, Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. So I would encourage you that we are living in the end times. Um, if we survive another thousand years, preachers like me are going to say the same thing. And what we should do is not get a bunker and some canned goods <laughs> and make funny charts and signs and stand on the corners and preach. We should live holy lives. We should love people, we should let our light shine, and we should talk about Jesus. So whenever that day comes, we're all ready for it to come. All right, next question. As a Christian church, how do we respond to the Me Too movement? Oh, great question. Um, I'm going to try to tackle this actually next summer. We have a four-week series called God and Gender. We're going to talk about all the stuff that's going on in our world with um, sexuality with gender identity with male and female. We're, we're just imploding as a culture. And so I, I really appreciate this honest question. Um, I think we really, really need to start with loads of compassion and listening. Um, man, I'm a guy who lives with three females. And I, can, I cannot imagine how my heart would be broken if anyone hurt any three of them. And if God has a fatherly heart that's way more compassionate than mine, when any of his daughters gets hurt, man, our, our first response as Christians should not be to critique a movement or wonder if there are false accusations in the world. Like, I, I think just to listen and to, have our, to know that, what is it, one in, is it one in three or one in four women will be violently assaulted before their 18th birthday? I mean, according to the odds, I'm living with three women, one of them, statistically in America, that's happening too. So when Jesus looked at the crowds, I think in Matthew chapter 10, it says he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And I think compassion. I think we should, 1 Corinthians 12, weep with those who weep. 
I think we should stand up and we should fight and defend. Now, are, are there false accusations in our world? Um, sure. Remember Genesis 39? Potiphar's wife accuses Joseph of rape and sexual assault and he didn't do it. Uh, does that sometimes happen? Yes. Yeah, sometimes people lie about things. But if I'm walking into a situation, like that's my gut reaction to things, man, I, I'm really going to wound and hurt someone who might have really been hurt and needs a Christian like me to show intense compassion. So I think we should weep. I think we should mourn. I think we should be happy that a lot of the wickedness that's happening in our culture and that powerful people could get away with, it's being exposed. So despite its many, many flaws, I'm very happy that we are taking some sins way more seriously than we used to. If you want to see me uh, get kind of ticked off, uh, tell me how great our country used to be 75 years ago. Christians do this all the time, right? Things are going to crap in America. Well, I'd be really glad if I was a black woman now compared to 75 years ago. <laughs> when what, many, many people went to church and racism was 50 times as bad. Like, don't, no, no, no. Sin is sin. Every cultural era has to battle its own sins. And it's really good that we're starting to realize some of that, especially as the Christian church. So let's take the side of those who've been hurt and oppressed and damaged. Let's stand up for truth, but let's be filled with grace too. All right, next question. What do you consider to be the most dangerous influence of modern Darwinian evolution? Well, I have a list in my pocket. Actually, I brought them with me. <laughs> um, I think at least the atheistic version of Darwinian evolution, that you're an accident, like led to its logical conclusion that you have no hope, your life has no meaning, you're just here, you'll die, and help to advance the species. If you're weak, we'll get rid of you. If you're strong, we'll pass on your genetics. There is no right, there is no wrong. Let strong countries conquer the weak. I, I think that just robs us of the things our hearts all internally crave. It's really hard for people to actually believe the implications of atheistic evolution. Because if it was totally true, then why wouldn't we want strong countries to run over starving poor countries? That's just survival of the fittest, right? But we know, like something in our heart says no. When we see that on television, like that, that is not right. What, why do we feel that way? Well, because God put something in our heart to recognize the difference between right and wrong. So I, th I think when you're raised in an environment that said, yeah, you're just kind of here by an accident and your life really has no purpose, so have fun, you're going to end up in the dirt. I think that just robs us of all the hope and the beauty. I think that's actually a really cool thing that Christians have the opportunity. Those of us who realize that God created us for a purpose and whether we're scrubbing toilets or preaching sermons or closing business deals or changing diapers, like there is a God who sees all of that and has purpose every day. There, there's something beautiful about that that people are drawn to. So instead of freaking out about the whole science and religion thing, I think we have a really unique opportunity in our day to live with hope and peace and purpose. Um, Bible passage. Oh, I love Psalm 139. God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. All my days uh, before me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Just the beauty of being a child of God is a really cool way to live. All right, next question. How many Old Testament prophecies are there? Is there a place to find a list of them? Um, I'd Google that if I were you. <laughs> um, I've heard, I've never done this research myself, that there's over 300 Old Testament prophecies. Um, I've heard that over 100 of them come true just in Jesus himself. You know, born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, put on a cross, raised from the dead on the third day. Um, I don't have an exact number. It, it's super cool. Maybe next time you're reading through the New Testament, every time it says, and it was fulfilled, what was said through the prophet, like circle that, write that down, and see what your list looks like. All right, let's do two more questions, and we'll wrap things up. Will we recognize people in heaven? Also in heaven, will we have memories of our time on earth? Um, I'm trying to think of a Bible passage that would talk about that. Um, Revelation 7, so when, when John gets this glimpse of heaven, he says, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Now, how did John know they were from different tribes and peoples? Like they had to have some appearance to them, right? So one would think that we're, rec you know, we're still ourselves in heaven. How, you know, how does that look when we're a spirit without a body? I have no clue how that's all going to work out. 
Um, yeah, First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4 says, at least when Jesus returns, we're going to be caught up with Christians who have already died in faith. This is 1 Corinthians 4, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. The Lord himself will come down, the dead in Christ will rise, and we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we will be with the Lord forever. So I think the answer to that question is yes, we will recognize uh, Christians in heaven. Second question, in heaven, will we have memories of our time on earth? Well, we know, um, same part of the Bible, Revelation chapter 7. Why did you make me turn from that page? All right, you didn't. It says, never again will they hunger or thirst. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Revelation 7 verse 17. So there, there couldn't be any memories that make us sad or heaven won't be heaven, right? There couldn't be any heartbroken, grief, sadness. Uh, there's a passage from Isaiah that says, you know, the, the former things will pass away because God will make all things new. So this is kind of my guess. Don't write this one down. But, but either we just don't think about that at all because we're in the presence of... When my daughter... Uh, stream of consciousness answer here. Did you pick that up yet? When my daughter Brooklyn was born, I, I did not think about my credit card debt. I saw something so beautiful that it totally like consumed my thoughts. So I don't know. When you see God, do you think a lot about? Remember my eighth grade basketball year, Jesus? <laughs> like <laughs> I'm sure it's just so glorious and good. Like your heart just explodes with joy. Or maybe, or maybe God like helps you see his wisdom through all the ups and downs and you come to be grateful for every day you went through. So the stuff that made you frustrated with God or mad at God or confused at God when he reveals like what he was doing and you just come to praise him and trust him and glorify him even more than more, that's a possibility too. But I couldn't prove that one with the Bible passage. All right, and our last question for 2018 question and answer Sunday is how does Jesus intercede for us? <laughs> yeah, so intercede, where is that? Where's that in the Bible, guys? Do you remember? The book of Hebrews, that is correct. Hebrews. I thought it was chapter 4. No. 1 John chapter 2. All right, I got it. 1 John 2, my dear children, if anyone sins, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So the Bible uses all these pictures to help you know what a rock star Jesus is and one of them is the idea of intercession. You know, it's like, here we are in God's courtroom. There's stacks of evidence against us. The devil's accusing us of all the things that we did. He doesn't have to lie at this point. And here's God. He's just and fair. So he has to take it all into account because sin really hurts people. And kind of the picture is Jesus is interceding. And before the evidence is taken into account and a verdict, he stretches out his pierced hands to God and he says, but Father, it's finished. That's true. He sinned, but it's finished. And the Father looks at the wounds of Jesus and he says, not guilty, set free, and righteous. So how does Jesus intercede for us? It's just a really great word picture that says the God who will judge your soul has to get to Jesus before he gets to you. And because Jesus is perfect and his case is compelling, not a single Christian who looks to Jesus in faith will be condemned on the day that they die. And because of that, we have so much joy. We don't have to live with any shame or guilt. We don't have to drag the past with us into a new year and say there's just Jesus. He was there before and he's going to be there in the year to come. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a lot of questions and a lot of answers. Whew. Hey, John, up in the booth, how many more questions we got to answer? He's laughing. <laughs> At least 10 more. All right. You can check out social media in the weeks to come. I'll try to answer the questions I think can answer. Thank you very much for some great questions. Uh, in a second, I'm going to have you stand and pray with me as we close things out with our final song. Uh, but first, uh, I got to tell you some really good news. So I love, on my good days, I keep a journal at the end of each day of just the stuff that happens. Um, it's not like a, it's a do journal. Do you know what I mean by that? 
So it's like just bullet point list. It's not Dear Diary. What a wonderful day I had. <laughs> and I love at the end of every year, some of my favorite things to do is to look back and to remember everything that happened in my life. And honestly, it floors me every year that I do it. All the blessings that I forget, all the things that had happened, like, oh, that was this year too, and that was this year too. And I have to let you know, just in case you've forgotten, this has been a ridiculously good year at our church. And I want to thank you, and I especially want to glorify and honor God. Uh, we started this year out... Uh, Raise your hands. How many of you were here when we did the Break Your Jar campaign? Yeah, a whole bunch of you. I, I challenged you in one sermon if we could give, what, $31,000 in seven days to a nonprofit you didn't even know about, and you decided to up me by about ten grand, and we gave over $40,000 to a missionary organization on the other side of the planet. That was an incredible day. Um, the cameras that you see here around uh, was a new partnership we started with Time of Grace Ministry. Do you know on the other side of those cameras, there are 400,000 people who watch what's going on here every single Sunday. And on next Sunday, the first sermon that we recorded at the core from last January will be on national television. Um, and you know, despite all the changes that that has brought, like our church just like, not the reach of it, but like the depth of it has gotten so much better. Pastor Michael has come here. He's been a great blessing to you and our ministry. You've accepted him so well. Uh, you made it so easy for us as pastors. Um, because of the Time of Grace partnership, they reimbursed my entire salary back to our church. And do you know who we were able to bring here? That guy. So as you enjoy the music and as Jonathan is raising up uh, such great musicians we have at our church, like that's a blessing from the partnership. All right, we can clap for Jonathan. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Jonathan, favorite, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it has been, do you know what happened here on Christmas Eve? We, our staff for months has been praying boldly that God would bring 500 people. The most we've ever had in 10 years as a church was 408 total people. We had 441 people show up at the first service. <laughs> at the first service. And another 180 at the We had 621 people come here on Christmas Eve. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I know that didn't happen just because of our staff. So many of you were just so passionate about telling the people that you know and inviting them to hear the good news about Jesus. The way we started the year, the way the year went, I know there were ups and downs and challenges, but God was so good to our church this year. And I thank you so much for all of you who pray for this place, who give generously to make our church what it is. Uh, we're pretty excited about the year to come. So I'd like to invite you to please stand with me. Let's honor and thank God for this past year. Uh, after the prayers that I lead, uh, you'll find the words of the Lord's Prayer up on the screen. Let's pray. Uh, dear God, we thank you so much for your grace. And the more we study your word, the more our eyes are open to the law and exactly what it means. And uh, the more we realize that every single moment, God, we need grace to be true. And we're so thankful that it is. God, I, I honestly don't know how people in other religions do it. Just convince themselves that they've been good enough. I, we love so much the fact that your love comes with no strings attached and it's a gift that you give every day of the year. I pray, God, that this would be our calling card. That when people step into this church in 2019, they might hear good tips for their life, but more than anything, they would hear good news about Jesus. I pray, God, for peace and for hope. That in a world that wonders why we're even on this planet, in a world where so many people have been hurt by other human beings, in a world where so many of us battle anxiety, depression, and mental health struggles, that there you are, consistent and faithful and steadfast and strong. I thank you, God, that you never change. I thank you that your resolution for this next year is to be the exact same God you were last year. And because of that, we don't have to live with an ounce of guilt or shame or confusion, but we can have peace and joy in you. God, thank you for loving our, our church. You haven't promised that people who work hard at a church and try to be faithful will grow, but you allowed us to grow this year. You've given us more people, more resources, more volunteers, and more of an influence. And I pray, God, we could handle those blessings responsibly. Help us not to be proud. Help us never to look down on another church that isn't as big as ours or growing as fast as ours. Help us to love and praise and trust you even if we shrink this year. Help us to be so content that you are just with us because you promised where your word is preached, there you are. And I pray, God, that you would help us uh, to keep our foot on the gas pedal. As much as we love being here, there are people that we play with on our sports teams. There are people that we're going to work with this week. There are members of our family who don't have that peace. That they just don't know how good you are. 
And I pray that you would send us on a, on a passionate, white-hot mission to reach them, that they would share eternity with us. God, thank you for hearing prayers. <laughs> thank you that when we talk to you, we're not just talking to the skies, but because Jesus intercedes for us, you hear every word and you love the sound of your children's voices. God, thank you also for the opportunity to ask questions. I was praying that you keep my voice strong, so thank you for helping me get through tonight. Uh, thank you for the mind and the memory to turn to your word. And I pray throughout this year we can continue this practice, that we could ask each other really honest, good questions, open the Bible, and find great answers. Thank you, God, for being an amazing Savior. We praise and thank you in Jesus' name. And we now join in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Please remain standing for our final song. favor of